Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. This is the first day of Daylight Savings Time that we are recording this. And so, Will, um, thanks for joining me again on Monday. Thanks, Charlie. Happy Daylight Savings Time. Yeah, see, I hate this. I've, I've hated it for years, but I'm going to spare everybody a rant about it because it's old and nobody cares, right? Except, <laughs> see, for somebody that always has had to get up very, very early in the morning, that first few days is disorienting, although I have to admit that I did like being able to go out and walk with the dogs after after six o'clock yesterday. So I will get over it. Speaking on behalf of the night people, um, I'm, you know, it's, this is like a faraway war for me. I'm sorry about your daylight savings time. It's a tragedy for you, but I am insulated from it. And thank, I, and I'm the guy who gets to enjoy the extra hour in the evening. Yeah, tragedy is doing a lot of work there in that sentence. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm griping about it. It's sort of an irritable gesture rather than a declaration of tragedy or, or victimization. Um, I, you got to say, Will, you had a great uh, tweet uh, last night. I really like this. You were tweeting somebody who was sort of running through the record of countries that Vladimir Putin has uh, has waged war in. And uh, Sarah Kay, who I don't know who that is, but said, uh, consider the size of the country where Putin waged his wars in chronological order. Number one, Chechnya, 1999, one million. Two, Georgia, 2009, four million people. Three, Syria, 2015, 17 million people. Four, Ukraine, 2022, 40 four million. He's scaling up and quickly each time he chooses a bigger prey. And you tweeted out, eventually the python tries to eat a porcupine. <laughs> I, well, which I thought was, was perfect. This yeah, is those, this, Twitter at its best. This is actually a real thing, the uh, porcupine story. But I mean, her point was Putin keeps taking on, keep, he keeps eating countries. So he keeps killing people in cities, taking yeah. cities and getting away with it. Right. right. Well, and it's, her point is it keeps well, working. Yeah, that's easy. But, yeah. but there's a kind of a Peter principle to this, you know, like you, if you keep failing up, but the, the, uh, the, there's a kind of a law of nature here that the predator will keep trying to take bigger and bigger prey until it takes on too much. And it's one thing if, you know, you're a leopard or you try to take on some beast that you can't take down and you, you slink away. But what if you are actually trying to eat the thing, which is what happened to a python? I think it's 2015, Charlie, a python that literally did try to eat a 30-pound porcupine. And of course, it wasn't the pounds of the porcupine that was the problem. It was the quills, which then punctured and killed the python, right? And this may be Vladimir Putin's porcupine. Ukraine <laughs> might be at 44 million people who are willing to fight like hell the thing that kills him. So this story you're, that you're claiming is true, it's actually too good to check. I mean, it's, I, <laughs> I, I want to believe it. So I, you're willing to vouch for this, that actually there was a porcupine and I a have python? Seen, I have seen the CNN story. I have seen the picture of the dead python. And I have seen not only that, I'm sorry to say this, but nobody can actually see it on a podcast, <laughs> the picture of the dead porcupine having been extracted from inside the python. See, this is the problem. It kills the python, but the porcupine doesn't survive. Since we're stretching out this really excellent metaphor. Uh, uh, that's perfect, actually. That is exactly where we are right now. The Both the python and the porcupine are, I won't say dying, but suffering. Well, there, there's a lot going on in American politics and worldwide. And I want to get to, we're going to spend most of our time on Ukraine. I, I had a, I always have to try to determine whether or not my reaction is just the mood that I'm in at the given moment or whether or not it reflects anything. I was watching the coverage of the former guy's speech in South Carolina, his various rants and raves, and he's, you know, trying to spin uh, U Ukraine. And, and he declares that if he becomes president again, he's basically going to wipe out all civil service protections that he wants so that every single employee in the executive branch can be fired by the president of the United States, which would be a rather significant change. And I, I thought about it and I was making notes. And I thought, you know what? I just don't give a shit anymore. I, I'm, I'm bored by him. I just, I just, I shouldn't be. And I know we need to pay attention to guys like this, but there was a sort of just a, you know, not, not today Satan feel about that. Do you know what I'm getting at here? It's just like, there's, there's, there's real stuff going on and going back to like, okay, here's the latest crazy thing that, that Donald Trump said. I just, I, I don't know. It's, wait, wait a second, Charlie. Are you I, telling me yeah, that, I, that the never Trumpers are reaching a stage of fatigue never. with Trump, that they're just going to yeah. move on? No, 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 no. Because I, I think we need to morph into never again Trump. 
It's <laughs> it's just that this moment where there's so much else that is driving the news. I mean, I maybe it's because you probably are more of an expert on this than I am. Um, are there like a finite amount of brain cells? You just have so much room or in, to, to switch the metaphor. We just have so much bandwidth. And right now there's just it's 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 overloaded. And I just don't have enough bandwidth for Trump shit. Yeah. And, you know, I almost think this was part of what made Trump so effective, which was he was so awful all the time. And you you just couldn't be telling your your friends or your colleagues or or the world, you know, yeah. this guy is awful every day, even though every day it was true, right? You just you get tired of it, they get tired of it. And personally, I felt like I'm getting boring, right? I I gotta say something besides this guy is doing another awful thing, even though that was the news every day. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry that I've been trolling your your Twitter feed, but there was somebody who tweeted at you, I think, stop covering what this vile, inconsequential lizard says, just stop. And you push back on that. And I, and you said, I strongly disagree with the view often expressed on Twitter that journalists should stop covering public figures who say dangerous things, looking the other way or dismissing such people as inconsequential is one reason why these people gain power and could regain it. By the way, I completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, we were talking literally about Stephen Miller, who, yeah. who was a senior advisor to Trump and had enormous consequences. And the tweeter is calling this guy, he's inconsequential. Don't pay attention to him. I mean, this is how it happened, right? This is how these so-called inconsequential people took over first the Republican Party, then the presidency, the United States, you know, threatened the whole world. Uh, they are extremely consequential and you yeah. cannot look the other way. Yeah. One of the big failures looking back is that we ignored these people because we thought they were inconsequential. And how did that work out for us? Uh, some people have not learned the lesson there. But speaking of Stephen Miller, I wasn't going to play this right now, but uh, since we're, we're, we're commenting on this, this is the the homunculus uh, former Trump uh, aide who was on yesterday morning and, and had some deep thoughts about uh, what Ukraine should do to end this war. Let's play Stephen Miller. But at this point in time, we are looking at a Syria-like situation on our current path with endless bloodshed and violence. It's worth considering whether or not to publicly propose the condition of a negotiated settlement that includes Ukrainian neutrality. That's not a permanent solution. It does not end the problems forever. It does not make these longstanding issues go away. But if it has the potential to save hundreds of thousands of lives, it should be considered so first of all, I would prefer to have my face eaten off by fire ants than have a beer with that guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I am sorry. What a com- I just he's like reading off these talks. So basically what he's saying is that U- Ukraine should. OK, surrender. This is this is the this is the appeasement line. And we're, we're, we're getting this from from Trump world at the same time that we're getting. Can we play Lindsey Graham? Because I want to juxtapose them. So. From Stephen Miller, you're getting the, you know, let's just become neutral, accept Vladimir Putin's uh, demand. And then then there's Lindsey Graham yesterday. And the Biden administration looks at Putin as a partner for climate change and an Iran deal maker rather than a war criminal. Biden's more afraid of Putin losing than he is excited about Ukraine winning. And uh, let you hear it from me. Victory for Ukraine. <sighs> OK, Will. OK. I'm willing to be very critical of Biden on a lot of different grounds, and we're going to get to that. But Lindsey Graham's comments, come on. OK, so, Charlie, these these were not only said, the Stephen Miller quote and the Lindsey Graham quote, not only said on the same weekend, they were said back to back on the same show. OK, they were both on the Maria Bartiromo show. Stephen Miller comes out, right? And he does. And and by the way, there are lots of people who have commented, you've been asked about, you know, what kind of deal could be cut to get Putin to back out of Ukraine. Uh, they've said something. They've commented maybe on what Zelensky has offered or, or hinted at. This is not what happened with Stephen Miller. Stephen Miller came on that show and what he virtually read from a script. He had prepared this, this appeasement plan, right, yeah. to get Putin to back out. He is then followed five minutes later by Lindsey Graham, who is not only taking the opposite point of view, but is attacking Joe Biden and claiming that Joe Biden is literally like afraid that Putin will lose in Ukraine. He's accusing him of being on the side of evil and the anti-American side and the taboo, right? And there's just no, I mean, the cognitive dissonance between these two wings of the Republican Party is nuts. And I have to say, as somebody who comes from a Democratic background, I cannot believe that these guys get away with doing this stuff. We, meaning the Democrats, would never, ever get away with that. You know, if you had somebody out talking about, like, 
the Republicans accuse the Democrats of being for defunding police because some infinitesimal percentage of the Democratic Party believes that. And they tar, Republicans tar the entire Democratic Party with it. How is it that so many Republicans can be out there, you know, putting out propaganda on behalf of, you know, that's perfectly consistent with the Russian foreign ministry and Vladimir Putin, and somehow Democrats do not tar them with that and Republicans turn around and pretend like they're still the hawks? Yeah, well, uh, Democrats are bad at this messaging, apparently, but right. I mean, they, they should be tarring them with it. Well, look, I mean, so much of this this criticism is in bad faith and self-contradictory. I, uh, over the weekend, Patrick Chubanek laid out this hypothetical. He's you know big time economic strategist. And he says, if China ever invades Taiwan, Fox News will simultaneously argue, one, why should American boys die for Taiwan? Two, this only happened because Biden is weak. Three, Biden provoked a war to distract us from and fill in the blank. Four, Biden isn't doing nearly enough to defeat China. And, and you know, the fact that he writes, the, the fact that this is completely contradictory will bother no one who watches because in their eyes, the real enemy is at home. Now, what I thought was interesting about that was he's obviously spot on. But he has the added advantage of describing exactly what is happening right now with Russia and Ukraine. You don't need to do a hypothetical about Taiwan. So you will have these things, you know, in people's heads at the same time. Biden is too weak, um, but, you know, Biden isn't doing enough to defeat uh, Russia at the same time. You know, American boys should not not die of Ukraine. All of this cognitive dissonance, I suppose, is one of the consequences of when you actually, you know, give up linear thinking for tribal loyalty. So, Charlie, I are the Republicans going to pay any price for this? I mean, I'll put to you my theory, which is they won't. They won't. They'll they'll argue both sides of this. They're more isolationist than the Democrats. They're more interventionist than the Democrats. But they're the out party and people are unhappy. And so they'll put Republicans back in charge of Congress this this year. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. And uh, maybe I'll work toward my 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 other weekend thought about Biden. My, my newsletter today is, I would say, somewhat critical of the messages that Biden is is sending. But I think that the criticism is bipartisan, um, but I, I, I don't disagree with you. So let's talk a little bit about what's what's happening. And Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was on. Do you remember which one of the shows it was? When I'm just Face the movie. Nation. Fa Face the Nation. OK. And CBS had some very interesting polls. Uh, I mean, this is a very, you know, this is an interesting moment, Will. Um, and, and, I, and I posted the YouGov numbers. There's no partisan gap, really on Ukraine and Russia anymore. Uh, also overwhelming support for uh, uh, stiff sanctions uh, and, you know, strong action. Of course, you know, you take all these polls with a grain of salt. So, I mean, at the moment, you know, you would think, you know, Biden's got the wind at his back. Um, but, uh, you know, that's all of these things are temporary. In any case, Jake Sullivan was on Face the Nation yesterday, and this is what he had to say. But none of the sanctions you've imposed so far have stopped Putin. So is there any red line for the administration here in terms of humanitarian catastrophe that would mm -hmm. change the president's calculus? Excellent is question. this a game changer? The use of weapons of mass destruction would be uh, a shocking additional line that Putin is crossing in terms of uh, his assault on international law and international yeah. norms, his assault on... Uh, the human rights and human dignity of the people right. of Ukraine. Uh, but bottom line, Margaret, the premise of your question, which is, well, sanctions haven't stopped Putin, so are they not working? I think we have to look at this in two respects. One is, um, have we imposed severe costs on Russia uh, for its invasion of Ukraine? And the answer is yes. And the second is, have we been able to help the Ukrainians defend themselves against these attacks, to push back Russian forces from being able to take major cities, mm -hmm. including the capital city, Kyiv? And the answer to that is yes as well. So and part far. of the reason why Putin is resorting to the possibility of extreme tactics like the use of chemical weapons is because he's frustrated, because mm -hmm. his forces aren't advancing. And right. one of the reasons they're not advancing the central reason is the bravery and skill of the Ukrainian people, but they are being supported by substantial amounts of military assistance from the United States and our allies. Will. Okay, so... He, he did not answer that question. <laughs> no, but well, he answered it in his way, and the way he answered it... I'm I not answering he, it. <laughs> well, the answer was revealing. The an he, There is always an answer, even if it's not like literally answering the question, right? It's a statement. And what he revealed is, 
She's asking, Margaret Brennan is asking about, hey, the Putin's still killing Ukrainians. You haven't succeeded. And he's saying, yeah, he's killing Ukrainians, but it's a sign. The way he's doing it is a sign that we're succeeding. And that is exposing this huh? very <laughs> this very fundamental difference, right? Which is there there are a gap has opened in this whole Ukraine war between what we can do to save the Ukrainians and what we can do to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And the way we make sure it doesn't happen again is that we raise the price. We make it, we make it a loss for Russia, which is different, right, from saving the Ukrainians. So the Ukrainians are imposing costs on the Russians. They're killing Russian soldiers. They're destroying vehicles. The Russian army is failing. And we've been imposing costs by imposing sanctions and getting more weapons into the Ukrainians. And that has not, of course, stopped Putin from killing, right? He's he's still attacking, still destroying. And he seems determined to just keep destroying even as his country, his own country is being destroyed. And so we're failing in that respect. But I have to say, Charlie, I agree with Sullivan that the big picture here is to make this a loss for the aggressor. Yes. To, because if we can do that, we can prevent the next Ukraine, right? No. We can... <laughs> you don't believe it. Why? Well, OK, first, first of all, I, I don't think he answered the question because she was saying, uh, OK, so if he uses weapons of mass destruction that crosses a line, we have to impose a cost. What is that? This is the problem right now that we have not deterred Vladimir Putin from invading. We have not deterred him um, from escalating. We have not deterred him from the war crimes. So the question is, will, you know, what are you willing to say to deter him from doing something even more horrible? And he's not answering. He's not answering the question. So we continue to say all of, of telling Vladimir Putin all the things we will not do. And we draw these bright red lines, which I have to say, you know, seem to give him a green light to do, uh, you know, up to anything other than invading a NATO country, which we can get back to. Uh, you know, when I mean, the, 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 the last week, Biden, Biden statement, I want to be clear. We will defend every inch of NATO territory. This is good. But we will not fight a war against Russia in Ukraine. A direct confrontation between NATO and Russia is World War III and something we must strive to prevent. I agree with some of the critics who are saying that one of the things that you're doing by using this imagery of World War III is you're deterring the United States and NATO more than Vladimir Putin. Because what you're doing is you're raising the cost of any of our intervention while accepting Putin's threats at face value. So Biden saying, hey, you know, if we start shooting each other, it's World War Three. First of all, it's not World War. And number two, all confliction does not lead to conflagration. But that also makes it harder to justify any other steps we might have to take. Like, for example, what if Putin uses uh, chemical weapons? What if he moves into another non-NATO country like Moldova? What if? It becomes necessary to make, you know, humanitarian Berlin airlift style flights into besieged cities. So what you have is Biden drawing a line saying we are not going to do anything about those things that would risk World War Three. In some ways, that's a dangerous message to Vladimir Putin. OK, we have a disagreement here. I know. All right. So first of all, You're it wrong. is it, it is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. All right. So first of all. It is not binary. It is not we're going to do something or we're going to do nothing. It is that we're doing different degrees of intervention depending on who you're attacking and the way you're attacking, right? So when Biden says we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory, that's he's talking about direct military action. The United States and its NATO allies will get militarily involved, will shoot at you if you come into NATO territory. It is not true that if you attack someplace that is not NATO territory, we're going to do nothing. And that is manifestly not true because we are doing things. First of all, we are sending weapons, uh, weapons that are killing Russians, right? We're just not we're just not operating those weapons ourselves. Secondly, we are implementing the world's most suffocating sanctions ever. True. Yeah. Right. And so he is paying a, co a consequence. We are deterring to the extent that we believe we can short of that second state. I think it's fine. Well, but will. If you make that argument, you should say, and we have deterred him from blank. Yeah. What have we deterred him from? Well, first of all, we're agreed, right, that beyond that, we, that he's not going into NATO territory, right? We're agreed that, that that second line has been deterred for now. I don't know. Okay. Well, he hasn't done it yet. Right. But what has, right. What has he been deterred from other than that so far? 
Right. Remember that deterrence, and here I'm going to contradict myself a little bit, deterrence only works to the extent that the other party makes a rational calculation. We have raised the price of his attack in Ukraine to the point where it is the costs outweigh the benefits. So what will we do if he uses weapons of mass destruction on Kiev? Well, that's a question. First of all, my, my answer what is- What does he think that, we're going to do? I think that he may expect an escalation of the sanctions to begin with. Um, it is possible that at that point, I'm a skeptic of the MiGs, but it's possible at that point we would send in the MiGs. I don't actually think the MiGs would make a qualitative difference in terms of the degree of resistance Ukraine is putting up. But you know, I, I don't have a great answer to that question. I believe that Honestly, there's nothing that will stop Putin if he's determined to destroy Kyiv from doing so. Mm, well, I, the question is, should we try? And, and going back to the, what does Vladimir Putin think we're going to do? I, I think there's a very real possibility. And of course, you know, I mean, I don't know what goes on inside Vladimir Putin's head any more than anyone else does. I know that, that that caveat should be obvious. But, um, you know, I, I think at this point he's thinking, looking at the various statements and going, I can do that. And they won't, you know, I mean, I've, I've, we've crossed red lines before and they won't do anything, you know? Okay. So what other sanctions are out there? They're going to stop buying what they're going to do. What, uh, this is, this is the problem. I don't, I think that we have made ourselves more nervous about what he might do than he is nervous about what we might do. Yeah. That's my real, my real concern. Okay, and, but, and, and if that's the case, then we are deterring ourselves while not deterring him. Yeah, and sorry, this is bringing me back to the python and the porcupine. You know, he he's he seems determined to swallow the porcupine, and you know, it's stupid. It is a net loss for him. And I, I mean, what I really hope, Charlie, is that over time, and actually sooner rather than later, these sanctions immiserate Russia to the point that there is a coup in the Kremlin. That is not completely unrealistic um, because the damage to the country is so great that, you know, at some point that is rational. And if it is not Putin, if Putin will not be rational, someone around him will have to be. But, you know, honestly, I think that uh, this porcupine is in the process of being digested. I, I shouldn't put it that. Let, let me back off the metaphor yeah. here for a yeah. second. The, the, you could, because actually, let, can I be a little optimistic for a moment? I would like I'm, someone to be optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm a congenital optimist. I will point out that the latest defense maps from the uh, the latest maps of Ukraine from the from the uh, British Defense Ministry indicate that actually Russia has less control of territory than it did yeah. the last time they had a map out. There's a little, there is uh, that may be that they overestimated how far the Russians have gone, but it might also just be consistent with the general observation that they've overextended their supply lines, that they're they don't have enough forces to, to besiege the cities that, are, that they've undertaken, and that we may be sort of at a turning point in terms of the Russians having to start playing some defense and being less able. Having said that, they're going to, they have artillery close enough to Kiev, right? They're going to park it there and they're just going to shell the city. And I don't have a great answer to your question about what we're going to do. Never mind the, the weapons of mass, you know, they start shooting chlorine or something into there. But if they just, just the plain old shelling of, of residential areas, I don't have a great answer to that, but I would put the question back to you. What would you do at that point? Well, first of all, I would not constantly be giving you know statements about what we would not do in Ukraine. But but at that point, I do think that we need to think of much more aggressive steps, including including uh, and I know this is controversial, the no fly zone, uh, the humanitarian flights and, and do it. Basically, you start with the humanitarian flights that are that are accompanied. I, I think that whatever weapon systems that we have not yet given them, we ought to consider giving them, including the Patriot missiles. And I understand there are technical issues in, involved with all of that. But I do think that we have to raise the military cost, the economic sanctions. I don't think penetrate his psyche the way military defeat does. No, no, okay, uh, can we just stick with the optimistic for a moment here? Yeah, because I think this is important. Francis Fukuyama had a good essay over the weekend, a really important essay uh, in his, uh, in his uh, publication, American Purpose. Let me just read you what he says. He said, I'm going to stick my neck out and make several prognostications. Russia is heading for an outright defeat in Ukraine. Russia plan Ru Russian planning was incompetent based on a flawed assumption that Ukrainians were favorable to Russia and their military would collapse immediately following an invasion. That's all true. Russian soldiers were evidently carrying dress uniforms for their victory parade in Kiev rather than extra ammo and rations. I don't know about that. 
Putin at this point has committed the bulk of his entire military to this operation. There are no vast reserves of forces you can call up to add to the battle. Russian troops are stuck outside various Ukrainian cities where they face huge supply problems and constant Ukrainian attacks. The collapse of their position could be sudden and catastrophic rather than happening slowly through a war of attrition. The army in the field will reach a point where it can neither be supplied nor withdrawn and morale will vaporize. This is at least true in the north. The Russians are doing better in the south, but those positions would be hard to maintain if the north collapses. There is no diplomatic solution to the war possible prior to this happening. Okay, that's an optimistic point of view, and I don't think it's completely baseless at this point. And if, if, if in fact, the information we're getting is is accurate, and that's always, 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 always a big if in the fog of war. Yeah, but notice there what Fukuyama is predicting on the optimistic side is a defeat for Russia, right, which right? would be and great. the defeat is a yeah. net loss, right? It's a net loss. That is not the same as predicting that we're going to be able to save thousands and thousands of more Ukrainian civilians from being killed in the process. Yeah. And it also does not mean that there won't be some catastrophic end. I saw that you tweeted about what uh, the former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, said yesterday on CNN, that it was just a question of time till Russia either hits NATO territory intentionally or not, or uses chemical weapons in its siege of Kiev. It's not if, it's when. Do you agree with him on that? I mean, that's that's pretty horrific. Yeah, well, he's saying that Russia will cross these lines. What we do at that point is an open question. But I'd like to apply the Charlie Sykes test, okay. which is like, which is at what point do enough people in the West uh, get so pissed off and, and angry about these Russian atrocities, say, you know, the use of chemical weapons in Kiev, that we demand that our governments do more and the governments do more. I mean, this actually has already happened, right? We're very close to that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's where these polls come in, right? How many Charlie Sykes's are out there saying, I've had enough, we have to do, we have to do more. Well, let's talk about the other uh, story over the weekend that Russia is reportedly asking China for uh, military assistance, which uh, obviously leads to a, you know, will lead to a um, very consequential decision by the Chinese. But also some people have pointed out, you know, it's kind of a revealing tell for a country like Russia uh, two, three weeks into a war to say, basically, we need help from somebody else. Uh, that is certainly a sign of, of weakness on their part of the fact of, of how uh, badly damaged they have been. I think that's true. But uh, talk to me about the decision that the Chinese will make and, and what you're looking for there. Well, the Chinese, you know, are, are trying to construct a, a, a relationship and a sort of an alliance with the Russians. This was announced what before the Olympics, mm -hmm. I believe. And, uh, you know, they're, it's going to be sort of an anti-Western uh, alliance to the extent. But the problem is that the Chinese would not have handled Ukraine the way that Putin did, oh, right? This, so. this is not. So it, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment to them. And it's really important, actually, that what, you, what Putin has done is to unite the West, right, in, in opposition to this. And that's a threat to the Chinese because the Chinese don't want a unified West that's, that's certainly not an anti-autocratic West any more than the Russians do. Um, and that, that may be what's happening here. So I think that the Chinese are looking at this and thinking this is, you know, not, not good from that standpoint. And also, of course, the Chinese want to take Taiwan and to, to watch another country stage an invasion before them and see the world unite against that. That's very daunting to them. So I think, I think so that too. they're a little, they're alarmed. Well, also the alliance with Russia has to seem a lot less attractive now than it did say a month ago. I mean, it's like, it, it, it is like uh, booking a ticket on the Titanic while it's going down. But also, I think here's a fundamental difference. Uh, the Chinese have invested massive effort and resources into being integrated into the world economy. They really want to be accepted within the, the international community. And I think that what they're realizing now is that if you do this, you will be a pariah nation. Now, maybe Vladimir Putin doesn't care about being a pariah nation, but I think the Chinese care very much about being a pariah nation. Okay, yes, but in order to be a pariah nation, you have to be treated like a pariah, right. and that assumes that the West will maintain its resolve. These sanctions are expensive for everyone, right? They're expensive for us. The price of gas is going up and will go up more. Are we willing to put up with that? Because it's not just going to be gas, right? It's going to be expensive all the way around, and that takes resolve. And, you know, the West, in the absence of an actual hot war, has not shown terrific resolve over the years. Well, especially with China, yeah. Because, the, I mean, the yeah. economic impact on us... I mean, we, we, we can impose these sanctions on Russia. There are costs, but they're not crushing. 
the economic consequences of doing that to China would be much, much, much greater. Right. And I have to confess, and I don't know if you would say the same of yourself, I look around and think about all the stuff that I've bought in the last five, 10 years that's all made in China. And I just assume that. I yeah. assume it's there and I assume that the price will be what it is because it's made in China. And like, there are a lot of us who are going to have to do a sort of a gut check about, are we willing to let go of that? And are we willing to, in fact, make ourselves less dependent on China with all the expense that entails in the same way that we demand that the Europeans make themselves less dependent on Russian energy? Okay. So I'm trying to imagine this from the Chinese point of view. They're watching as Russia becomes a pariah nation, the possibility that uh, the entire world will be horrified at what comes next. What is the incentive for them to jump in and say, yeah, we would like some of our rockets to be going into Kyiv uh, and into Odessa as well. We would like to uh, give more artillery shells to a country that is using them to, to shell hospitals and kill pregnant women. I, I, okay, so I, I'm not suggesting that the Chinese are in any way humanitarians because we've seen their willingness to engage in, in genocide. We know who they are. On the other hand, uh, in terms of their their status in the world, I'm just I'm just not sure. So what's the upside? What do they get from that? Okay, so Vladimir Putin, who may or may not survive this, is going to be eternally grateful and will do what? Yeah, I I don't see it. I don't see it. I mean, we know why Putin would ask. We we don't know why that. So probably Charlie, it will turn out the way that we're that we're projecting, right? Putin has asked and China will decline. Although I don't think China is being asked for, you know, China is not going to send the weapons themselves, but they may, you know, they may be called upon for spare parts, resupply, that kind of thing. Um, but no, and I think it's super interesting that this intelligence is put out there. This is not the kind of thing I would expect to be put out so easily, but this is part oh. of the information war, right? The, the Biden administration says, we, we find this out, and I don't know what our sources and methods are for it, but we put out right away uh, this. We put out this information to, first of all, humiliate Putin to show that he, you know, can't he, that the Russian military can't do this. He's asking for help. And secondly, to put the Chinese in a difficult position, right, because we're not waiting till they do something. We're saying, hey, we know right now that he asked you. So if, if anything happens here, the whole world is watching you. So um, as we are talking, some the breaking news of Vladimir Zelensky will be addressing Congress on Wednesday which I think is good news because he bailed out of a speech today because there was some sort of an emergency. So I think that's going to be a significant moment. Uh, U.S. stocks are climbing and oil prices are sinking as investors monitor the war. Uh, I will confess once again, I don't get this. <laughs> There's so much about this. It's like you think, OK, so from a rational point of view, with the possibility of this war and more economic sanctions and everything, the stock market's got to be really, really, really jittery, right? I mean, it's got to be crashing. And, and why would the price of oil be declining? So I don't know if you have any insight. Uh, otherwise, I will you know, bask in my ignorance on this. I, I don't know. The, the only thing that occurs to me, Charlie, is, is the market betting that the U.S. is going to open up more exploration? Because that takes, that takes months. That takes a long time. If in response to you know trying to cut off Russian oil, the United States opens more land to drilling or whatever it is, or opens the petroleum reserve. I mean, the trends that would require this to pan out as a, as a financial bet will take quite some time. So I don't get it. Uh, well, I mean, I'll have, I'll have to read more about this. So debate last week, politically, uh, White House all in on describing the price of gasoline as the Putin, what Putin gas price thing and others pushing back and saying that's just not going to work. And uh, Kevin McCarthy, you know, once again, put out the same thing. It's, it's not what did he say? It's 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 not Putin's gas prices. It's Biden's gas prices, which was very, very helpful. But this is one of those issues where it makes your head hurt because not, neither side is completely right. Neither side is completely wrong on all of this. Right. So I guess from a political point of view, will the White House gambit to blame all of the inflation, all the gas price hikes on Putin? Will that work? Does that insulate them somehow? from uh, the electoral blame, because clearly there's kind of that calculation there. It's bad. It's hurting us. Oh, wait, we have somebody else we can blame for that. Will that be effective? No, no. It, I mean, it'll be marginally effective, right? But, what, you know, you mentioned earlier the polls on this, which are super interesting. Yeah. And what part of what the polls show is, I mean, they show significant resolve among Americans, including Republicans, people who say uh, th that they're willing to pay more for gas because of the increase that will be caused by the war uh, and by the sanctions, right? That 
it's that, that both of those are going to drive up costs. People say, yes, I'm willing to pay more. But then when they're asked about why the gas prices are up, they blame Biden, right? So it doesn't really matter that they that they have this resolve. I'm willing to pay the Putin price hike because they actually believe that it's a Biden price hike. And all of these Republican politicians who are saying, you know, we must stand together, we must, you know, go cold turkey on Russian oil, we must accept whatever comes with that. They are all out there simultaneously, and they will be out there for the whole election year, blaming Biden for every cent that the, that gas prices have gone up. I agree with you on that. So let's talk about the disinformation campaign at home. Uh, our colleague Amanda Carpenter has a great piece up in the bulwark today saying, you know, this time around, the uh, the, the Russians don't need trolls or bots because they have Fox News. And it really is remarkable, uh, you know, to watch the Tucker Carlson's, the Tulsi Gabbard's spread these, the, you know, just raw uh, prop, uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation. Tucker Carlson is routinely and regularly now featured on Russian state TV uh, David Korn from the, uh, from mother Jones got his hands on this absolutely fantastic thing. I don't know how he got it, but it, it's, it's fun reading it in the original Russian and seeing Tucker Carlson's name where, you know, Russian uh, propagandists are basically putting out the word use Tucker Carlson as much as possible. That's an extraordinary moment. It comes back to your question before. Will will Fox news and folks like Tucker Carlson, will they pay a price for this? This is hard to answer because it requires, I mean, it requires branding that yeah. organization and the people who, who view it and the, the politicians who appear on it as, as having a particular, I mean, Republicans, again, are really good with doing this with something like defund the police. And they do it despite the fact that, you know, 80% of the Democratic Party is against defunding the police. And right. the president of the United States who leads the Democratic Party is out there saying, I'm against defunding police. I'm for paying police more. It, and yet, you know, the Fox News has, I mean, to be honest, Charlie, doesn't Fox News have kind of a split screen? They've got Tucker, they've got Laura Ingram, but they also have Sean Hannity, who yeah. is pretty much pretty much towing the anti-Putin, anti-Russian line. See, I don't know. I mean, my, my knee-jerk answer is no, of course they won't pay a price because they never pay a price. On the other hand, it is clear that they may be misreading the moment, particularly public sentiment. OK, so there is that possibility that this is a major miscalculation. But having said that, I think the and I'm, I'm trying to step back and think, you know, what categories do you apply? The reality is and, and, and I think you, you touched on this. They, the, the Fox News world is not built on ideological consensus or any set of coherent beliefs. Anything that basically that identifies the enemy as at home. Anything that plays on the themes of, you know, let's go Brandon or Tony Fauci in the bioweapons lab is, is going to find an audience. So maybe there's not as much dissonance between Tucker Carlson's Putin slavering propaganda and what the audience wants as long as they think that it is targeting the right enemy. And the right enemy is always domestic. So I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. And that is, by the way, that is what has happened to the Republican Party, right? It is, it no longer has affirmative principles, or to the extent it has them, you know, it's all over the place. Uh, it's isolationist, it's interventionist, but it has, it, it's driven by resentments, right? It's just driven by owning the libs, yeah. right? Triggering and being, in this case, the Democrats have the government. And so we're against the government and we're against it from every point of view. We're against it from Tucker's point of view. We're against it from Sean Hannity's point of view. Um, you know, we, earlier we were talking about that Stephen Miller interview, like St Stephen Miller is part of uh, this. This is a lot, a lot of where the Republican party is, right? They don't have a foreign policy. What they have is a border policy. They're against immigration, right? We don't want the Ukrainians coming over here. We don't want the Afghans. We don't want the Mexicans, whoever it is. And and we should be more concerned about our borders than about Ukraine's borders. It's isolationism, but it's a kind of weird, hawkish sensibility. Weird, yeah. But, yeah. but it's but, fundamentally just against the libs. That's what it is. Yeah, militaristic isolationism. No, I, I think that's right. You know, it, it does occur to me that maybe we're doing a disservice. I am doing a disservice by asking this, does this work? Does the, will there be a price pay? Because, you know, shouldn't the real question be, isn't this just fundamentally wrong? I just, I just wonder what goes on inside of Tucker Carlson's head again to watch what's happening in Russia and think, how can I spin this in this particular way to imply the Ukrainians are the bad guys and maybe provide some cover for Russia. I would be 
humiliated and ha- and have a real crisis of conscience <laughs> if I knew that my words were being used to uh, you know bolster Russian resolve in the midst of these war crimes. I mean, there are some yeah. things that are evil. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to use the word treasonous, but I understand why Mitt Romney used the word treasonous to describe what Tulsi Gabbard is saying. They are providing aid and comfort to this evil regime committing horrific war crimes right in front of our eyes. You know, whether it works for them or not. I mean, fuck them. I mean, so they they may get more clicks, more eyeballs, better ratings, more advertising revenue. That's hardly a justification. Yeah, of course it is evil. It is evil. Yeah. And 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 Tucker Carlson and his ilk have uh, ha, represent the opposite. They represent not taking evil seriously. They represent yeah. an entertainment oriented view of politics, right? He's Tucker Carlson is a fundamentally unserious person. He gets on TV and he's trying to entertain and he's trying to tweak the libs. And what happens when he runs up against an evil so vast, right? Just the murder of so many innocent people in Ukraine, just the ruthless war machine that's destroying people deliberately. And and he treats it like it's another, you know, issue of the day, another opportunity to stick it to the Democrats. Um, you would hope that if not, you know, people like us complaining that it's evil or Democrats complaining that it's evil, that the evil itself is so manifest, so awful, that ordinary people see what is going on TV or on on the internet and they say, this is real, this is evil, and I reject everyone who has collaborated in it. You know, Bill Crystal had an interesting tweet over the weekend. He said, you know, we we keep referring to, and I I certainly have done this, refer to people like uh, Tucker Carlson as useful idiots. And by the way, our colleague Mona Chern wrote the book on on useful idiots. But he says this is really not accurate because a useful idiot doesn't really know that they're being useful because that's why they're idiots. So they are unknowing in being accomplices. But that doesn't apply to Tucker Carlson because he's not an idiot. He knows what he is doing, and if he's not a useful idiot, then that makes him a willing accomplice. And I think that that was an interesting distinction. Yeah, that's true. And Tucker is kind of in an interesting space because I don't believe that Tucker is literally getting instructions from the Russian foreign ministry to say what he says. Mm -hmm. However, he knows, as we all do, what you just said earlier, which was that they're using his, from this memo or whatever, but it's clear. He can see that his clips are all over Russian state TV. So he knows in real time that he is being used as propaganda by, I'm going to say the enemy, but the evil, the, the, the country, the government that is doing the evil. And yet he persists. And that is a level of complicity that's kind of beyond. Um, it's at, at that point, you, if, even if you're not taking money from the Russian foreign ministry, you know that you are a tool of them. And your persistence has a, a new higher level of moral culpability. Right. And, and he, of course, he also could then, you know, come on and acknowledge that the Russians are quoting him and then make a very, very clear statement that they can go, you know, F themselves. But, you know, I, I don't know. It, uh, this is this is one of those moments where uh, and maybe maybe guys like me are not the right people to analyze this because we have so much PTSD because we have seen this so many times. I mean, we are the people who, you know, had the football pulled from us over and over and over and over again. But Elliot Cohen made this point on the, our live stream last week. He said, you know, what makes this different from, say, January 6th is that it's on television every single night, not just one day, over and over and over and over again. And those pictures are going to get worse and worse and worse. So that will have an impact on on public opinion at some point. I wrote a story that I think may actually be a take that may not age well. I hope I'm wrong on this. I wrote a piece for Political Magazine saying, you know, why uh, the Trump's GOP hawks will never break with Trump over this because of the base and everything. I mean, I hope I'm wrong about that. But can you name one Republican who has broken with Trump over Ukraine or Putin who has said, this is my line at this point since the war? No, I can't think of one. No. The, and the reason is that what they do, and they've all developed this talking point, is they say, here's my position and yeah. my position. They're, they think that they can answer this question by saying, I reject Putin. Right. Putin is evil. Which is evil. And, the, and they, they, they don't have to address the Trump part. Okay. And they've gotten away with that so far. But I feel heartened and inspired by what you said earlier. Instead of being passive commentators on this, people like you and me and, and, and others should, you know, 
do what we can to, to hold to account those who are complicit or who are making excuses. So instead of saying they'll get away with it, I'm, I'll, I'll say they've gotten away with it so far and I'm going to do what, what I can to make sure they don't get away with it from here on out. And that's a good place to end. So, uh, Will Salatan, thank you so much for coming back on to our regular Charlie and Will Monday podcast. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again. Hey, it's Rich Eisen. And my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started. So why don't you come across the hall, take the chair and... Oh boy, wait a minute. I think I, I locked the door. That's not a metaphor for anything. How's the lighting in here? I mean, I'm vain, you know? So I thought for the first season try to bring you people I thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting and that's why I started off with Jeffrey Ross the comedian and then you know we've got a bunch of other asks out making Paul Rudd do it sorry Paul do you know that you're doing it and I want this to be inspirational life is really hard right now and sometimes you just need a little bit of help someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say you can do this and I'm hoping that's what you're going to get from just getting started go follow just getting started wherever you get your favorite shows